the Liberty was the fastest rum running ship in Prohibition era Atlantic Canada. She was powered by three airplane engines, which she used in the last episode to escape a trap laid out for her off the coast of New Brunswick by the Mounties, and escaped in a hail of gunfire by deploying a secret smoke screen and speeding away. In that episode, we met Hugh Corkum, the Liberty's radio operator. But how did Hugh Corkum get into rum running in the first place? We're also going to look at the origin of his famous ship, the Liberty. You're listening to Backyard History, the hidden stories that happened in your own backyard. The podcast version of the weekly history column running in newspapers across the Maritimes. With your host and author, Andrew McLean. Hugh Corkum had been a promising student in Lunenburg, Nova Scotia when he was forced to drop out of school at the tender age of 15 to help feed his family. He needed to get a job after his father, a sea captain, lost his job after crashing his ship into a submarine. He wrote in his autobiography, which is called On Both Sides of the Law, that Dad was having tough luck. He was the master of a very fine three-masted schooner named the Can Rhine, built in Le Havre, Nova Scotia. He loaded hard coal at Hoboken, New Jersey, up the Hudson River a few miles from Manhattan, bound for Halifax, home. Sailing down the Sound to open sea, it was fine and smooth, but foggy, all was going well, when out of the quietness of the night, all hell broke loose. Suddenly, and without warning, a large, massive object appeared low in the water. Before anything could be done, We collided. The stem twisted and spewed the bow planks open. Immediately, we took in much water. There was not even time to salvage personal belongings. The jolly boat was immediately lowered over the stern, and the crew got in without injury. The canrine was completely underwater and out of sight within ten minutes. We rowed around for several minutes and spotted a large black hunk, which we first thought was a ship bottom. It was an American submarine. The American submarine had been considerably damaged in the collision, and the U.S. Navy was not very impressed. Hugh Corkham's father was required to go to the United States repeatedly to testify at a long and drawn-out naval inquiry into the accident. In the end, his father was found not culpable, but only after years of court battles, which wrecked financial havoc on the family. Although the accident was in no way his father's fault, his dad lost his job anyway. Stuck with a reputation as a sea captain who lost his ship, he struggled to find work on another boat. There was no unemployment insurance, hospital benefits, old age pension, or baby bonus in those days. As was customary around Lunenburg County in those days, I decided to get a job to help my family. Even though several teachers attempted to discourage me from leaving school, but I was needed at home. I had three sisters to help educate. I was big, strong, and healthy. I could always get a job. Three months before his 16th birthday, Hugh Corkum went down to the docks of Lunenburg. There he heard a sea captain who was friends with his father was looking for crew. He went to that captain's house and knocked on the door. He was told to meet the captain on the docks in Halifax the following Monday at 9 a.m. So on a very cold winter day in February, 1927, I went to Halifax, signed on the Eastwood, my first ship as an able seaman. The ship was a hard-looking tub, sadly neglected, and the crew were just as bad. I could not have signed on with a rougher, tougher captain and crew on any waterfront in the world. The ship set off for St. Pierre and Miquelon, which are two islands off the coast of Newfoundland, which are actually a part of France. Historically, the people there have had a kind of curious mix of Newfoundland culture with the population being largely fishermen and boasting those colorful salt box style houses the Newfoundland's famous for, but also mixing in a whole bunch of French culture, which means cobblestone streets and fine bakeries and good wines. Wine, since it was part of France, was still legal on St. Pierre and Miquelon. France, of course, never did prohibition, unlike Canada and the United States. 
So as soon as alcohol got banned in Canada and the United States back during the First World War, those two little French islands suddenly went from obscure and largely forgotten home to a couple French fishermen to a bustling boom town running on booze. New buildings popped up all over town, and old ones were turned into refrigerated warehouses. Officially, the stance of French government officials was that they were extremely efficient at stopping European ships loaded with booze from getting their goods to Canada and the United States. The French said that all these new warehouses popping up were for the honest trade of legal products coming from Europe and going to North America and had nothing to do with alcohol smuggling. The Canadian and American governments demanded then to know if that really were the case, then why were all of these new warehouses refrigerated? Hugh Corkum wrote that when they arrived at St. Pierre and Miquelon, Captain ordered a dory launched and told me to get in the dory and take him ashore. I expected it to be a short trip. He proceeded to Chevalier Hotel in the center of town, with me following on behind. And many tall tales I've heard about that hotel, and my captain started to drink, and every drink seemed to make him more foolish, and this went on for two days. The teenage boy from small town Lunenburg was taken aback at the fast pace of life in the gangland hub that was St. Pierre during Prohibition. More than that, though, he wrote that he was shocked by the fast pace of death. There was a homicide in St. Pierre while I was there in Café Francis, which to us was known as Joe's Tavern. It was well patronized by all the boys from the Rum Runners and was a favorite spot to have a drink, spend a few hours, it was packed every night. A crew member of a ship in port had a disagreement on the dance floor at Joe's, pulled a revolver, shot him, cold blood. He ran through the cafe and escaped. Crew members of the Eastwood were questioned thoroughly by the French authorities. Many years later, in 1986, I heard the true story from a crew member of the Eastwood that trip. He was in a nursing home in Lunenburg, wanted to get it off his mind before he died. After the murder, he was in the engine room when a strange man, who he'd never seen before, appeared from behind the fuel tanks and asked for something to eat. He stayed there until the trip to New York, when he escaped with the cargo. 15-year-old Hugh Corkham shiploaded up 12,000 cases of assorted liquors and made its way from St. Pierre towards their destination, where they planned to offload the liquor, the United States. The Eastwood was what Rum runners called a mothership. These ships were the opposite of Hughes' later little speedboat called the Liberty. These motherships were large and slow moving. They were typically just repurposed old fishing trawlers, and actually, sometimes they were considerably bigger than that, though. On board, they would carry massive amounts of alcohol, but they wouldn't actually land or even go anywhere close to the shore. They would stay out in international waters, which would be 12 miles away from the coast, and there, the police ships weren't allowed to bother them. And they would sit out there and they would coordinate over radio with smaller, faster speedboats who would then zip in at high speeds to and from the mothership, load up with cargoes and booze, and then just hope they wouldn't attract the feared American Coast Guard or the RCMP cutters. The Eastwood's destination was Montauk Point on Long Island in New York. Long Island was a real hotbed of Maritimers back then, and the Eastwood was almost certainly meeting fellow Maritimers to offload the goods, not Americans. Back in the 20s, when the economy roared, thousands of Maritimers had moved there to work in then-booming New York, mostly in construction. In those glory days before the Great Depression, they could make as much as $4 a day, compared to back in the Maritimes, where working from dawn to dusk in the logging camps would only pay one dollar a day. When the Great Depression hit, and most lost their jobs in construction, they turned to another way to make money. Rum running. This one time in Long Island, Canadian Prime Minister William Lloyd Mackenzie King, who was strongly in favor of banning booze in Canada, actually had a personal first-hand experience with these Maritimers who lived on Long Island and were smuggling booze. 
You see, the Prime Minister had escaped Ottawa for a little vacation to Long Island, New York. He was always a pretty solitary figure, and his idea of a good time was a long walk alone on a beach. So he walked along the beach at Long Island, and he was surprised to hear someone call his name. The Prime Minister wrote in his diary that the person who recognized him was a Canadian fisherman from Cape Breton, Joyce by name. Apparently totally unfazed by alcohol being very much illegal at the time, and the Prime Minister being fiercely opposed to drinking, this fisherman named Joyce whipped out two bottles of liquor to give to Mackenzie King as a present. He then proceeded to just casually explain to the Prime Minister the logistics of rum running in detail. The Prime Minister documented this in his diary, writing, He presented me with a bottle of champagne and French cordial. This fellow tells me he spends a good part of their time going out to sea 15 miles and bringing in liquor from ships lying at anchor. The wines come from France, are transshipped at St. Pierre and Miquelon, and then brought down to this port and ashore. It has ruined their trade and morals. While he never went so far as to say it directly, it is quite possible that Hugh Corkum may have agreed with the Prime Minister's opinions that alcohol ruined the rum runner's morals. You see, his first trip on a rum running vessel, going towards Long Island, was not exactly peaceful. And that was, in his own opinion, squarely because of all the drinking that was happening on board. He wrote that on that trip, I learned a lot about men, what liquor can do to a good man, what an ass he can make of himself, and how dangerous a human being can be when liquor takes over. It always amazed me as a young sailor at the drunken old sea dogs, once they'd been at sea for a few days and dried out, were really the best seamen, almost without exception. Yet as soon as they would make a draw on their wages and proceed to get drunk, they were useless to man or beast. On that trip, he watched the captain of his ship become even more drunker and more abusive than usual. He watched a heavily tattooed sailor, they went by the nickname Dog, who had taken him under his wing, back when he was actually sober, become, in his words, a drunken idiot who punched out their client who was escorting the alcohol and paying for him. He also watched the cook on the ship threaten this client with a hatchet after he asked for a sandwich. He also watched the captain throw a full quart of whiskey at this client. And he watched as the captain got into a fight with the client, breaking three of his ribs. Presumably, this particular client never sailed with this particular crew ever again. Although, on the other hand, in the drunken crew's defense, Hugh Corkum did argue that this client was actually kind of awful. Apparently, he dressed like a cowboy, and he wa waved a revolver in people's faces. And worst of all, in Hugh Corkum's mind, he tried to order the crew around. So basically, this teenage boy's first experience as a rum runner wasn't going well. And it was about to get worse. After that whole big ordeal to get to Long Island, they didn't even get to land their liquor. As they approached, two American Coast Guard cutters came up and shadowed the Eastwood. The Coast Guard couldn't board because the Eastwood was still in international waters, so the Coast Guard silently waited nearby, doing nothing. As the Eastwood's drunken captain shouted curses from the side of the ships at them. Eventually the Eastwood just gave up on trying to land their wares in Long Island and sailed all the way back to St. Pierre, with the two American Coast Guard cutters following them the entire way back to the French port. In the end, not one single case of alcohol was actually sold, but a staggering 64 cases of booze were drank by the crew on that voyage. Young Hugh Corkum, for his part, not only vowed after that trip that he would never touch a drink as long as he lived, but that he would also never sail on the Eastwood again as long as he lived. He wasn't getting out of rum running, though. He just wouldn't be rum running on that particular ship. One year later, we find Hugh Corkum had grown into the high-flying life of a rum runner. 
and the money and the opportunities that came with it. Gone was the provincial teenage boy from Backwater Lunenburg. Now Hugh Corcoran was a suave and modern adult man who wrote enthusiastically about experiencing all that New York City had to offer during the Roaring Twenties. I was right in the center of Manhattan, and I liked it very much. I was familiar with some important spots, and I felt quite proud to be able to show my shipmates around. Some of them hardly left the hotel, though. They were the real country hicks. But I was gone every day, all day. I was ready to hit Broadway in style. We didn't even have to leave the hotel for excitement or action. Burlesque girls were staying in our hotel, and reporters frequented the hotel daily. I received passes from reporters to attend sports events in Madison Square Gardens. The Paramount was my favorite theater. I attended many games at Madison Square Gardens. Of course, some of the hot burlesque shows were not to be ignored. I learned so much. I experienced some underground speakeasy nightlife. We had access to several night spots where you had to be well known or vouched for to gain admission. On New Year's Eve, Times Square was packed with thousands upon thousands of people. It was a party never to be forgotten. Despite these temptations, though, he did actually stick to his initial plan of saving up money in order to get out of the rum running racket. He took his savings and he went to college in Indiana. He started school in July of 1929. Four months later, the entire global economy collapsed, and it was the Great Depression. Unable to find a job with his new degree in the wireless communications radio world, he went back to rum running. His degree actually wasn't a total waste though, because he found that there was a lot of demand and a lot more money for someone that could work a radio. Then he met what he called the pirate ship, the Liberty. In June of 1936, Captain Jack Howell of Metagon contacted me, asked if I would accompany him to the United States to bring back a speedboat. A Jack was an old friend, and we'd been through a few escapades together. He wanted me to be with him as a crew member, drop pilot, wireless operator. Sounded like a new and exciting experience. I agreed to go with him. For a fee. They, along with two American engineers, boated south in a direct line from Nova Scotia until they reached parallel with Cape Cod. Only then did they turn inland towards the American coast. Hugh Corkum wrote, The whole Cape Cod area, including Nantucket Sound and Buzzards Bay, was generally alive with cutters of every description. If we picked up a cutter and it followed us to the rendezvous point, it would be impossible to contact the speedboat. They were increasingly paranoid by the newly emboldened American Coast Guard, who took rum running very seriously. During the First World War years before, the United States had rapidly built up a massive navy. After the war ended, all those warships were abruptly repurposed for a new goal, to stop rum runners at all costs. Suddenly there was an entire fully armed navy's worth of heavily armed warships trying to stop little boats smuggling booze. These warships were not exactly trigger shy either. And sometimes they even fired upon Canadian ships in international waters, as we saw in the episode titled, I'm Alone. In order to compensate for this, the little rum running ships became faster and more sophisticated. Now special purpose built boats were being constructed especially for rum running, and they were sleeker and faster than anything ever seen before. Hugh Corkum and his crew of rum runners were making their way down the American coast quietly to pick up exactly one of these brand newly constructed ships. At 11.30 p.m., they waited at the rendezvous point for their new ship to appear. The weather was fine and smooth, real speedboat weather. To our delight and surprise, we saw a speedboat coming at us at terrific speed, the spray flying high above the rails. She has got a bone in her teeth, said the chief engineer. Only two men were on board the speedboat. Both were Americans. The engineer was nervous and anxious to get moving. He said, let's get away from here in a hurry. 
This place is hot. This ship is hot. A plane could be along here in any minute. They know we left the port, and they'll be looking for us. They began the handover of the new boat at sea. The Americans had sold the new boat with practically no fuel in it, so they had to fill it up with barrels at sea. Hugh Corkum noted that it took 900 gallons of fuel to fill up the gas tank. While the other crew were filling up the tank, Corkum was installing his brand new radio equipment. He noted that the ship had been stripped of not only food and supplies, but of any kind of interior decorations or really anything inside at all. The Americans called this bare-boned new speedboat the Hobo. At 3 a.m., the new owners of this American ship, called the Hobo, began to drive it for the first time. Hugh Corkum wrote that as soon as they turned it on, they realized that the American's name was ironic. She was a beauty. She was just about the finest, fastest, and most evasive run runner ever on the eastern seaboard of Canada. She was 60 feet in length, with a mahogany hull and bronze shafts, and she was powered by three Liberty aeroplane engines. The high-speed engineer who came up with her really knew his business. Wide open, the engine spit 2,100 revs, so she really spit when mad. Each engine was 450 horsepower. When it was calm, the spray could fly from her bow 50 feet in each direction. You really had to hold on as she took off like a bird. Despite being impressed with the boat, he noted that she was distinctly lacking in any refinements. The hobo had not been equipped for a full-time open sea duty. She had no sleeping facilities, no galley. There were only hammocks slung into what was not really a forecastle, but just a hole to crawl into. There was no pilot house or wheelhouse on deck. She was taken on water, even at low speeds. So they took their new pirate ship back to St. Pierre, where she was completely renovated and refitted. Now the carpenters at St. Pierre installed five nice bunks, beautiful built-in kitchen cabinet with drawers and cupboards and a basin, all painted with white enamel. I did not spare any expense. The hobo was placed under French registry and renamed the Liberty. The Liberty was truly a pirate ship on the high seas. Next, they assembled the Liberty's crew. We had a darn fine crew. Two American, two Frenchmen, myself, the only Canadian. We all knew our jobs, but I was the only one who really knew the coast. I was familiar with the drops. Ernest the cook was young, lively, and smart. Both Frenchmen could speak fair English. I picked up a bit of French. Hugh Corkum wasn't the captain of the Liberty, though. He was the wireless operator. That particular role would be filled with a Frenchman from France named Captain Ducat. Captain Ducat liked the good things in life. Fine music, fine food, fine women. We carried an abundance of exotic foods I'd never heard of before, such as canned tripe, frog's legs, and many French and Italian foods. We ate better than any other boat out of St. Pierre. Captain Ducat was always immaculately attired, very well spoken, never raised his voice or used profanity. He was not the type of man you would expect to be a rum runner, especially the Liberty. He seemed much more suited to an ocean liner or a cruise ship. I admired him very much. And so the Liberty began its reign as the queen of the rum runners, the fastest vessel on the Atlantic seaboard, smuggling enormous quantities of alcohol for vast sums of money. The demand for our product kept us busy almost every night, and our method of operation was very successful. Our boat was the finest and fastest rum runner ever to work on this coast, and I was the only Canadian to be on her crew, right up until the time she was captured off Prince Edward Island on November 6th. Which is another story. Stay tuned next week for the conclusion of the Liberty on the Rocks trilogy, when the fastest rum running ship of all meets its match in Prince Edward Island. That was Backyard History with your host, Andrew McLean. Thanks for listening, and stay tuned for another hidden story that happened in your own backyard. Produced by Jordan Lozier.